so we have seen equation 14, where we have diagonalized the one-dimensional Euler equations. So and what we have seen that is equivalent to the following form, so that is 14 that we have seen before the break, that is equivalent to saying for each component dwl dt plus lambda l dwl dx is equal to zero. So now we can see the index L, and that is true then for all three indices. So we get three scalar equations of this kind. And then we can do this, play the same trick as we have done also for the, um, for the scalar conservation laws, where you remember this was the characteristic speed in that case. So the F prime of U. So here we have something similar. So here we can also then use the characteristics and simplify the equations. So that means if we are on a characteristic with the slope lambda L, which you remember is U minus C, U and U plus C, then we can write that in the following form. Then we have the total time derivative of the L characteristic variable on the characteristic. And that is the characteristic XL of t, and then we do the derivation with respect to t, and that is equal to zero, and that is true on the characteristic dxl dt equal to lambda l. We can do the same thing as we did uh, for the scalar conservation law, we do the chain rule, and when we do that with respect to t, we get this, then we do it with respect to x, we get this, and then we do it the, this with respect to t. With this choice, this is lambda l. So if we have lambda l fulfilling the l uh, characteristic equation, then we see that that quantity is constant on the characteristic because its time derivative on the characteristic doesn't change. So that means then that the characteristic variables characteristic variables WL are constant on characteristics on the respective characteristics and they are given then by the slope lambda L. So dxl dt dt is equal to lambda L. So that is important. That can be exploited in different ways, as we shall see. First, the picture of that in the time-space domain. If we have x, and if we have um, the time here, so we can think of it in uh, two different ways. One way is that we are at a certain point in space, certain x location, for example x0, whatever we like, and at a certain time, and then we ask ourselves, where does the information come from? If we are at this point, where, how is the solution to the Euler equations determined? It is determined by the values on three characteristics. If we start with the one, uh, with the number one, so if we would have, um, if things would be constant, then we would have straight lines, but usually they are not. But this would then be the characteristic number one. Its slope is given by lambda one, which is in our case u minus c. And what is constant on this characteristic? On this characteristic, the W1, the characteristic number one is constant. So we can say that on this characteristic, the DW1 is zero. So that doesn't change. Now let's continue. And then we might have, well, again, 
I write it here as straight, but usually they are not straight. That would be characteristic number two, and that would be given by the slope dx2 of t dt is equal to lambda 2, which is u. And on this characteristic, the w2 would be constant. So on this characteristic here, the dw2 would be constant. And then we have another characteristic that would be the number 3. And there the slope is given by the eigenvalue of the uh, coefficient matrix number 3, which is u plus c. So you see here we have slopes u, u minus c, u plus c. And what is constant here, that is the dw3 is constant on this characteristic. So if we would have this situation that we have almost constant uh, slopes here, then we could also indicate what are these distances here. For example, the distance from here to here, this distance here, what is that? If we, have the t if we would have the time t here, that would be the time, then this distance would be ut. Ut, and the distance that we have from here to here, so this distance here, that is for the characteristic number 3, would be u plus c times t. u velocity plus speed of sound times the time. So that is the, the distance that the acoustic wave number 3 has traveled in the time t. And then we have here also something that is the negative, that is going in this direction here, and that is u minus c times t. So u minus c times t. So then we can identify then the foot points of uh, these three characteristics. And if we know what is happening here, then we know we can connect the w1 at this point and the w1 at this point. We can connect the w2 at this point and at this point the W3 at this point and this point. So we can, if we like, get three equations for three unknowns at this new time. So that is one way. And the other way is to say, okay, from this point these characteristics are continuing in, in time. So they, they go further. So they travel also information beyond. So that would be the idea then to, to see what is happening from this point, how does the solution at this point influence the solution in the future? We have both views. So this view that we first discussed here, that is the view that we usually take when we look at boundary conditions. But when we look at some schemes, then we sometimes look in this way. In any case, what we have is that the dw1 is zero on the characteristic uh, number one, so that it is on, uh, say, say on, I just write in, in this way, so it's indicated here, what it means. And if you look at the equations that we derived, we have them up here, the dw1. If that is zero, then also we can multiply it by something. Then we multiply it by 2c squared, in that case, to get a simpler expression. And then that is equivalent to saying that the pressure change minus rho c times the velocity change is zero. So then we, we just need to, to get a value, an approximate value for that, and then we can relate the pressure and the velocity at these points <coughs> where we need it. So here we know it, and here we need it. The same thing on the characteristic number two. We know that there the w2 is zero. So the dw2. So the w2 is constant. And that also means that we can multiply that. If we multiply in that case by c uh, squared, by minus c squared, to get the pressure first. So minus c squared dw2 is 0. So that is then equivalent to saying that the dp minus c squared the rho is equal to 0. So we get a connection between the pressure and the density changes in this way. 
and on the characteristic 3, we know that the change in W3 is 0. We can also multiply that by 2c squared to get a simpler expression. And then we see, if we look up there, we get that we get similar thing as for the first characteristic, just with a plus. So dp plus rho c du is equal to zero. So these relations are sometimes quite useful. So that concludes this part. So now we have some better clue on these uh, Euler equations. So when we view them on the characteristics, they become suddenly simple. Especially when we take the lambda locally as constant. That means the u uh, minus c u and u uh, plus c. Here it is also discussed when we have a source term. I leave that out. You can read that in the lecture notes yourself. Instead, we continue to the next part, and that is then getting us closer to discontinuity. So what we discuss here, we essentially assume that we have smooth flow so that we can do all these derivatives, but we might have discontinuities. And like for the scalar conservation laws, we have also here the rankine vigonier condition. We shall use that to get a relation of the jump in the unknowns, the conserved variables in that case, and the flux jump. So again, ranking equal your conditions, but now for we have also plural, so we have just one for the scalar, but now we have the conditions for our our all our variables. And we suppose, as we did for the scalar conservation law, that a discontinuity is moving with constant speed s. So then the Euler equations um, can be used, and from that, that is the integral form, we can derive, it is just a matter of uh, doing the control volume and see then what is happening in time, and we can then derive the ranking due on your conditions. them in the following form. That is equation 15. That we say the speed of the discontinuity <coughs> times the jump in the conserved variables to the right and to the left of the discontinuity is equal to the jump in the flux that is evaluated with the right state, the flux minus the flux evaluated with the left state. So that is that are the ranking new conditions. And what we assume here is that we have now x and we have the u, u is now a vector, remember, rho, rho, u, rho, e. And that we have a state, say, that is, uh, if we start with it, say we would have, say, a state UL, and you would, you would have a state UR. And then this is traveling, and after a certain time t, we will be here, and then this distance here, so if the one that I had drew first, if that's the initial condition, U of x0, and this here is the solution u of xt, then this distance traveled by the shock is st. 
So otherwise we then have UL to the left and UR to the right of the shock. And that is then moving all the way. And then we can have the, we can look at the situation when we are in the frame of reference moving with the shock. If we are in that frame, then S is zero, and then this FR, F of R minus F of L must be the same. So that is an example now when in 15, that is the Franklin Ivanur conditions, if we are in the coordinate system moving with the shock that is fast and we are sitting still, shock speed is zero, and then we get a relation between the fluxes. And it turns out that the jump in rho u, that is from the continuity equation, is zero. That means that the rho u right minus the rho u left is equal to zero. So that means the rho u is constant. And then we get from the momentum equation that the jump in rho u squared plus p is on the left and the right is the same, so the jump is then uh, zero. And that means then that the jump in u times rho u, which we have said that is the same, so we can factorize that out of the jump, plus the jump in p is equal to zero. And then we can also use that rho u is constant for the energy equation, and then we get that the jump in the total enthalpy times rho u is zero. So, and then we have two kinds of discontinuities. One for which the rho u is not zero, that something is, that we have a velocity passing through the discontinuity, or we have the velocity zero. And if the velocity is not zero, we have a shock. If the velocity is zero, we have a contact discontinuity. So that is the distinction between those two. We shall see that shortly both of them, both the shock and the contact discontinuity for the 1D Euler equations. But I want to give examples for uh, in 2D. So first the uh, definition, so we get a shock if this, uh, the quantity that we have seen is constant then over the discontinuity with the shock speed zero, if that is not zero. And my example here is flow over an airfoil at transonic speed. So you have, uh, you have m infinity here coming. And it needs not to be supersonic, but at some point, at, at some region here, of, over the airfoil, then the, so we get something like that. Let's see, let's see color here at the moment. Okay, we take it without color. Then this is finished. So in this region here, the Mach number is larger than one, and outside the Mach number is smaller than one. And this is a shock. So the supersonic region is terminated by a shock. Sometimes if you're lucky on an airplane, you can see a line then on the wing, where it hits the wing. It's not a good design though, because it increases the pressure on the upper side, which is not good for lift. So that is the shock, and the contact is continuity. That is then something where the flow doesn't go through if rho u is equal to zero. And again, if you have an airfoil, and we would not have the viscosity involved, it would, would idealize things, and we would have a faster speed on the lower side. If we look at the speed and the velocity vectors, we would have a a higher velocity on the lower side, so also up to the here, so that would be higher velocity down here, and we would have smaller velocity up here. 
then there would be no flow through this sheet here, but we would have different velocities on either side. So in this case, then this sheet here, uh, which is then the, the discontinuity in the velocity, would then be a contact discontinuity. Okay, so but we shall come back to that for the 1D Euler equations shortly. Now, we want to see a certain problem in which these phenomena, and also another phenomenon, the rarefaction wave or expansion fan arise. And now we see the physical contents of what we already discussed for the Burgess equation. There we had a rarefaction wave and we had a shock. And now we see where they come from. They come from gas dynamics. And the situation where they occur is in a shock tube. A shock tube is a device in experiment experimentation, experimental fluid dynamics, where you generate high velocities, high pressures, high densities, to do experiments for a very short time. And that can be then described mathematically as what we have already seen for the 1D scalar conservation laws as a Riemann problem. So the Riemann problem, we look for the 1D Euler equations. Say if we would write them in differential form, they would be u t plus f of u x equal to zero. with a piecewise constant initial conditions. And that is 16, that we say the initial condition u of x0 is equal to the state to the left, which is constant, and that is for x smaller than zero, and u right for, that is another state, for x larger than zero. And this is used to generate, uh, it can be used for, to generate high velocities and high temperatures in shock tubes. So that is used to generate high velocities and high temperatures. there so that the diaphragm goes and then a shock will move into the right followed by the contact discontinuity with, which distinguishes the gases. We might have helium on the left and we might have air on the right. So how does that look like? Um, this is an example from Göttingen from the group of my former colleague uh, Klaus Hannemann, let me see if I can get that one larger. So, this 
So here we see the schematic diagram of that. Let's see. And uh, so we have um, the diaphragm you see here in the middle. And on the left, we have then, we compress the gas, and this is actually done by a piston. So this is solid steel, and that is accelerated to the right to compress the gas extra. And on the right we have the test gas, which is usually air, and then the diaphragm is blown off, and then the shock will move inside. You have here the time, the space-time diagram, so the shock moves very fast in. We have some reflection and some expansion into the nozzle, and here we have the model. And that is then followed by the contact discontinuity. And between these times, that is uh, tangent from the rarefaction wave, and this is the location then in the time space of the contact discontinuity, that is a matter of uh, less than millisecond, we can do the experiment. And the catch is that with this device, you can get really high pressures and high temperatures, high velocities to do the experiments. And that is usually done for doing experiments for the re-entry situation. When you have a space vehicle returning to Earth, the critical phase is when it re-enters atmosphere. And then you have Mach maybe 20 or something like that, and you have real gas effects, so a lot of complex physical and also chemical phenomena take place. And to do experiments for that, that is extremely critical. For the space shuttle, they were just lucky that it worked with the flap. They were at the edge of that it, uh, just, it just worked. They had done it by experiments, experiments at that time, and they were just lucky. If, they had, uh, if the flap hadn't, couldn't move that far, they went to the very end, it would have failed. Anyway, this, is done, this was done in, at uh, Göttingen at the DLR, German Aerospace Research Establishment, and it was uh, commissioned by ESA, European Space Agency. And that was during the 90s when the Hermes project was active. So this is what it looks like. It's I think, some 60 meters long. And um, so that is the background. So it has really a physical, uh, a strong physical significance. And we want to calculate that. So we want first to understand what is going on. And then we want to calculate that. That is exercise five. There you have a, a tough problem. There is a blast wave, a strong wave with a very strong uh, difference in pressure, 10 to the power 5. So now, but now we look at a little bit moderate, more moderate, a moderate example here. And the example, <coughs> I can show you that also, that is taken from a person called Sod wrote one of the first books on numerical methods for hyperbolic problems. And um, then, let's see. So we get here a couple of results. So first we have to understand what is going on here. So here we have a, a situation that is similar to the shock tube that we discussed. We have on the left here the pressure, high pressure, it's normalized to 1, and on the right we have a pressure which is uh, 0.1, so we have a pressure difference of 10. So it is not as severe as you do in the exercise 5. We have a pressure jump from 1 to uh, 0.125, so it's 1 to, uh, from 8 to 1, and the velocity is 0. And then, that is the the initial condition, velocity is zero. If we look at the density here, what happens? And then we see that the shock, it's the shock here, that moves quickly to the right. This is the contact discontinuity, which is smeared, because this is a numerical simulation with 800 cells. And here we have the rarefaction wave, or expansion wave. So from this side, we have high, Density and here we have low density, so the flow gets rarefied if we go in this direction. And that will continue. This is a numerical error, and the shock is fairly well resolved, but the contact discontinuity not. We can get that better with a 
define a grid resolution, but this shows you the main phenomena that you can expect. Okay, so then we want to get this understanding of the physics first, and then later on we look at the numerics. So, let's see, we have, um, if we write our plot, our our shock tube down here, then we have, in the beginning, we have the diaphragm here. So that is the diaphragm. And then we assume that we have, say, we have helium on the left and that we have air on the right. And um, in our case, we assume then that we have something of the following initial conditions. This is x, and we plot that then now here in our solution. We shall also have a plot of the, of the characteristics up here, x and t. So, so first we plot the initial condition. The initial condition for the density was that we have here 1 and we had here um, 0 0.025. Let's see. We take it. So we take then here, this is the density, so that is the row. So that is the row left and that is the row right. And then we have the pressure, and the, so that's the initial condition. The pressure, I, I write it here uh, to, so that we can distinguish. Well, that was difficult now. I think I need color anyway, but, um, well, if we write it here, you will see it. So that is the PL, and say we, we take the pressure down, down here, P right. And the velocity is zero in the beginning. So the velocity, so if we have the origin here, so the U L uh, is zero and the U right is also zero. So that would be then the initial condition. And then what happens is that we get a shock, a contact, and a rarefaction wave. to the right, so we start from here, so if we imagine that we want to see, so this is the shock, if we are at a time, say at certain time t here, then we shall later on look at the results at this time t. So in this case the shock has traveled then this distance here, this is the origin, this will be then the shock speed, so it has traveled here. If we go down here, then it will be in this region here, and later on, so it means it will be here. So that will be the shock after time t. So that is the shock. Here we have the shock. So, and uh, first we look at the different phenomena, and then we re-plot in the solution. The, um, if you can see that, tell me, that is the, uh, the contact discontinuity, can you see that? That is the contact discontinuity, Sorry, I write it in the desk. Normal chalk, contact discontinuity. And that distinguishes then the helium from the air. So if we go down here, so then it will be, this discontinuity will be at this location after the time t. If we go down here, it will be here. If we go here, it will be here. So here then the contact will be then, at this time, it will be, it, let's see, that was the ur equal to zero, but we are then interested now in the, in the contact discontinuity. So this is the contact discontinuity. Um, 
affect this continuity. And the rarefaction wave will go to the left, and that is then a fan where we might have, in which the density uh, gradually uh, is decreased from this side. So if we go down here, then we will get up. We will get uh, up here. Let's see, we get up here. So that will be the start of the expansion fan. We go here, so here we will start the expansion fan and it will end here. So this, so this in here we will have the expansion fan. Um, expansion fan or rarefaction wave. So. So now we want to look at the solution. So then we have already here some help from the density, that is the most interesting one. So for the density we see that we have, uh, that we have the shock present. So now we have, um, uh, let's see, we have the shock present, so we go from U right, then we have uh, the shock I think I need some other color here to indicate that. So we have the U right, we have a jump in the, in the density, and then it stays, stays constant up to the contact discontinuity, from the shock to the contact discontinuity, and then it jumps again. And then it stays constant, up to the start of the rarefaction wave and then we have, um, you see, almost linear increase from this side to the density to the left. So that would be then the density in that case. So that would be the row here. For the pressure, let's see, for the pressure Let's see if we start, if I do that with dashed lines now, then it will feel the shock. So there will be a shock here, and then that will stay constant, and it will not feel the contact discontinuity. The pressure is constant across the contact discontinuity. We get up to the first characteristic of the expansion fan, and then we get up to this value here. So that's almost linear. So that is the pressure, what we have here. So that's the pressure. And then the velocity. The velocity... The velocity to the left of the expansion fan here is zero as it was initially, and to the right of the shock, it is zero. That is zero. And it jumps at the shock. So it jumps at the shock. Now let me see. Right here. Yes, it jumps at the shock. Now I have difficulties here with the colors. Let's see. Let's see. I do that by dotted, dotted here. So it, that is the velocity. So and then it stays constant. It doesn't feel the contact. It goes up to the first expansion, uh, first characteristic of the expansion fan, and then it goes down continually to the end of the expansion fan. So this is the velocity at this time. So that means we get between the shock and the expansion fan, we get we can get high velocities. So that is then. Uh, this example here, 
Let's see. Well, I took the contact to the shop here a little bit on the wrong location. They should have been down here, but that doesn't matter. The important thing is that we get three phenomena here. We get the shock moving quickly, very fast to the right, followed by the contact discontinuity, where we have then the helium, in that case, on the left, and the air on the right. So we have then this, this is then the distinction between the two different gases. So we have then the helium here, and we have the air on the right. And they are moving both with the same velocity u. Velocity is the same here. And, and we have then the shock is then moving into the air. Okay, so that is what we can expect. You get a little bit different picture because you have a very strong shock uh, due to the large difference in uh, pressure, initial pressure difference. And you have uh, also a difference because the density in your case is simply the same on both sides. So, that is the, uh, an example of a shock of a new problem, the shock view problem. Shock view problem means that the velocity initially is zero, we have discontinuities in density and pressure. So, tomorrow we'll continue on that, and then you'll see how you can easily compute that. You know it already from what we saw last time with the Rusanov method, you can apply that directly, and then uh, you will see that the similar phenomena as we see here, that is done with the Roosevelt method, that you don't get sharp discontinuities, especially before the contact is.